Great. Uh, I think we are live now. So, um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Groves. I'm the lead architect for client onboarding over at City Group, and uh, we've also got Andrew Carr on here. Uh, Andrew? Hello. So, I'm uh, head of consultancy uh, for the Bristol office in Scott Logic. Cool. Okay. Uh, so, we're going to be talking about synthetic data generation today. Um, won't go to it's quite a broad subject, it's quite deep. So, we're going to kind of go over it quite lightly today. Uh, but if there's any questions, we'd love to hear them. Um, you can also contact me at, uh, there are contact details on here if you want to kind of learn a little bit more. So um, let's get going. So there's, uh, within Finos, there's two synthetic data generation projects that are live there right now, um, Data Hub and uh, Data Helix. So uh, Data Hub came out of City Group and what we produced was a set of Python libraries that were helpful to doing synthetic data production. So uh, it kind of supported two use cases, one where you could hand write rules kind of features and then you could go and generate some data. Or there was, we've got facilities where we can analyze existing, existing data sets, kind of make a statistical model out of that data set and then use that to produce then synthetic data. And uh, we've also got Data Helix. So I'll throw over to you, Andrew, to quickly say something about that. Yeah, so Data Helix is slightly different in that it was a uh, synthetic data generator designed to generate large volumes of data really quickly. So uh, we tried to do it where, um, I guess, similar to the modes that Paul talks about with the Data Hub, where you can throw it at data and, and analyze data and then uh, generate it, where we described our own uh, data language to describe the rules of the data such that someone who wasn't necessarily a developer could write down all the rules and generate data very, very quickly. So I guess the first use case was really for uh, testers who wanted to do load testing on the system and, and generate that data rapidly. Over to you, Paul. Cool, great. Oh, actually, you uh, more data helix stuff. <laughs> actually, yes, my full screenshot there. <laughs> I apologize. So um, yeah, so I guess uh, if you look on the left-hand side, you can see uh, sample rules uh, that describe the data. So you can describe uh, the types of the columns, you can describe certain rule sets. You can say uh, that this string flows this regular expression. You can put conditions between the, the data. Uh, and this, if you go to this Finos playground, you can actually live edit a profile and then press run, and it will generate some data based on that profile. Thus, you can have a really quick turnaround uh, to generate some uh, quite realistic data quite rapidly. And, and the example is, is, is pretty um, simple, but it shows you a bunch of rules that will generate that data in the right-hand side. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. Cool. Okay, so synthetic data, you know, what is it? It's, there's a lot of talk about it these days. And um, simply, anything where you can algorithmically generate data, that's what synthetic data is. So there's a lot, as we've probably touched on before, there's a lot of um, ways of doing this. Typically, we're looking in financial institutions towards synthetic data because, um, we're looking around data privacy. So how can we populate our test data systems with realistic looking data, but that it um, that has full privacy on there? Um, so I think a lot of people, we've come down this um, data redaction route, and then we've obviously discovered issues there, particularly around re-identification. And then we've also, many of us, gone down like the full anonymization path. And often we found the results were not particularly weren't particularly happy with the, the results. Like for those anonymizers to fully anonymize, we've often ended up with just trash data at the end of it that has no use within really within a test system. So what we're trying to do with synthetic systems is try and produce realistic data that has the characteristics of the real data, but there's uh, absolutely no way that we can breach privacy, no way we could accidentally recreate real people synthetically. Um, so it's not a new thing. It's been around a long time. Uh, some of the history of this is um, a lot of the work in synthetic data that we can kind of see now is uh, pioneered in the 90s by the US Census Bureau, where what they wanted to do was share out the data sets without revealing any of the actual real census data, because it's quite confidential. You have people's salaries, race, religion, lots of things that people would maybe want to put out there. So... Um, what they were doing was essentially, and also as issues of incomplete data as well. So what they wanted to do was kind of statistically populate missing data with, with realistic values. And so they spent a lot of effort doing this. Um, in a slightly more fun way, um, if we go to the opposite side of things of trying to recreate kind of believable worlds based on rules, 
um, anybody probably around about my age or Andrew's age uh, who used to play games on the ZX Spectrums and BBC Micros probably remember this game, Elite. And this, again, was a form of synthetic generation, or it's more procedural generation, which was how can you create a lifelike galaxy that you can go around, trade in, do things, and keep it consistently generating. Um, and so that was a, uh, a really quite clever algorithm, algorithm that they generated back then. And that was kind of also like the, the genesis of, I guess, of that kind of procedural generation of kind of world creation. So a completely different way that you can use these tools. Uh, and it goes way back. So it's nothing new. Uh, as we touched on, there's two kind of big use cases we're seeing out there in financial services right now. There's the whole GDPR, um, all the laws we have and regulations around protecting PII data. The problems of that anonymization and re-identification that a lot of us have found. Then on the opposite side, you have kind of machine learning. So while you might not use synthetic data, well, you definitely wouldn't use synthetic data to train your ML uh, or your AI, particularly in the data engineering aspects of building an AI or ML pipeline, is um, your developers might not be allowed the real data um, again. To get it. So you need kind of stand-in data sets that look vaguely realistic that you can use in your development systems. And then you have other, other things where you might have a team of people that are working on the, say, say tagging data, uh, actually working on the real production data set, and it's not available yet. So while you're doing the work in terms of your data engineering, you might need some kind of standing data sets while the real work's kind of going on to you know, get the data that you need. So there's kind of two different use cases we're kind of seeing a lot around here. Um, so yes, three, we've got three main approaches. Redaction, which is simply removing sensitive information. You have the risk of re-identification. You have anonymization, which is much for the process where we ensure re-identification cannot happen. There's a bunch of tooling out there that can help you that. Or we go to synthesis where we, Again, you've got those two words where you do it procedurally, where you handcraft your rules and you procedure generate, or you analyze production data, observe the patterns and generate from there. Um, and that's kind of where we're roughly at between Data Helix and Data Hub. Uh, data Hub's kind of morning lean to the analysis side. And uh, yeah, I think um, we've got Data Helix, which is much more the kind of the procedural side. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, Andrew, do you want to hand over to you now on this one? or? Uh, I, I don't mind. Slide, I think. think... <laughs> yeah, I think this one's your slide, but you can. I can talk to you, Sean. Yeah, no, you go for it. Okay, so um, I guess uh, there's there's lots of problems with uh, redaction. I I think the the challenge with redaction is when you start to uh, use redaction to get to the point where you can't do the re-identification. Um, is you have to remove so much as to to the sometimes the data becomes unusable and not useful for the task at hand. So you end up with just a slosh of data that doesn't actually represent the original data in any form whatsoever. So there are real troubles, uh, challenges with redaction. Also, the, the other problem with redaction is it does take a long time to do. And then you have to get to the point where, as Paul says, you have to verify that you can't then re-identify the individuals uh, in the original data. So Paul, if you go to the next slide. Um, yeah, do you want to talk about uh, differential privacy? Yeah, so differential privacy. So um, what we tend to talk about there is uh, when we talk about differential privacy is the point where you're basically creating a statistical model of the data. And out of that statistical model of the data, you sh it should be general about the data. There should have the properties of it, the distributions, any constraints found in there, essentially the rule sets for that data. Um, but you mustn't be able in that data set be able to re-identify an actual individual again. So you know, if we look to this example back here of the HR data, where, um, you know, you could simply cross-reference, if you redacted people's um, names out, you could simply cross-reference it with like a, an HR phone book. And then if you hadn't removed things like salary information or the rest of it, you'd quickly work out what everyone's salaries were or other confidential things you didn't want to find out. Um, so it's, yeah, quite critical. Differential privacy is quite critical to synthetic data generation, particularly when we're doing it the analysis of existing data sets. So if you're looking at a typical synthetic data flow where you're doing the analysis stage, you'd often start with you know, your production data. So in your production environment, this is our boundary. We have another boundary, which is our non-production environment. You start by you know, querying your production data. You'll certainly remove any PII, easily identified PII attributes out of there. You know, names, social, social security numbers, addresses, all those good things. You don't want those in your data set at all. 
Um, you will then do your analysis on it. So to find out where these constraints, distributions, and other interesting properties are, and produce this kind of DP data file, this differential privacy data file, this statistical model. And that should be then safe to transfer to a non-production environment. And then you're into your synthetic generation. So that's your kind of analysis mode. Then you've got your generation mode, which is where you take this statistical model, you put it into some kind of thing that can produce data out of it that looks like the original data set. And when you've done that, you might then choose to enhance it. So as you remember, we've redacted all the PI attributes out of it. We've removed people's names, addresses. So now let's add back fake names and addresses back in there. And now you've kind of created this virtual lifelike um, uh, representation of the original data set. But everything it refers to can't possibly have ever existed in real life. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful in this space, uh, particularly with your data analysis. There's lots of different approaches to doing this, this analysis, produce the, um, the DP data file. What you tend to find out is you've got to be very careful of um, anyone who knows anything about like being near machine learning, understands the curse of like hyperdimensionality, where you have so many dimensions of the data that actually everything resolves back to one record and one record only. And if you do that, quite often it's quite hard. So when you're doing your analysis, you have to be quite careful of what dimension, data dimensions you're actually interested in and remove the ones you're not that aren't important. Versus, I guess, now we've got the procedural generation, which is quite simply, you offer some rules, you produce some data, do something with it, put it into your database. Um, now, that could be a lot more involved because the developer has to sit there and handcraft the set of rules. This is really useful approaches where you're, um, you might not have any data. Like, it's a brand new system, you've got no data, so you just need to start generating something for your test system to start working with. Um, so that's, that's those, those kind of scenarios. Or you need a lot of data very quickly, um, and it's got to be you know, relatively simple. So um, yeah, with that, I'll hand back over to you, Andrew. Cool. So if we take a step back, so obviously we've highlighted that there's different approaches to uh, generating synthetic data. Um, the question is, when do you use which approach? And I guess I'm going to chat to you a bit more about the uh, rules-based approach where you generate synthetic data from a bunch of rules and when that's useful. So I guess if you if you pull all the different use cases of uh, why do you want test data, you can pull them back. And this is a bit of a generalization, but it, but it often holds true. Uh, sometimes you want low volume, highly accurate data, and that's typically to test functionality in the system. And for that, you need the data to absolutely be accurate. Otherwise it might not trigger the correct functionality in, in the system. Um, sometimes you want high volume, reasonably shaped data, and it's re you know reasonably accurate data, and that's often to test the load whether that's a you're doing a, you know can the system deal with this throughput, uh, can it deal with uh, data and process at a certain speed, and and can the system um, respond given a certain volume of data, and with that that tends to be the use case that you will you'll typically do rules based generation data, um, depending on the use case as you said. Uh, you considering should support the approach. What I'm going to do is walk through an example of how a simple use case, if you want volume data, can get complex very quickly using a rules-based approach. So I generally recommend if you're going to go for a rules-based approach, use it when you want uh, kind of large volume data, and it just has to look reasonably realistic. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Okay, so like I said, what we're going to do is do a simple example uh, and this is a financial services or capital markets example, I guess. Um, imagine you want the simple test data of a trade ID, a stock ID, a stock name, uh, a price, and uh, a trading date time. So if we go to the next slide, if I use really simple rules and said, actually, you know what? Um, the trade ID is a, a, an integer, the stock ID is a string, the stock name is a string, the price is a float, and the trade date time uh, is just a trade date. Now, clearly, uh, I think even people who are outside of financial services will look at that and, and see that that's clearly a nonsensical uh, bit of data. Um, it's valid according to rules that we just gave it, but it's not really usable. Even for functional testing, this probably wouldn't be very usable. Uh, if you look at the price field, it's not to two decimal places. Um, you know, it could easily break part of the system on the, in even basic checks. Uh, and so if we go to the next slide, um, if we try and tighten up some of these rules, um, we could try and generate a bit more realistic data as well as giving it the uh, the types of each field. We could give it rules about the field. So we could say that the stock ID should be taken from an enumeration. 
Uh, we could say the stock name should be taken from enumeration. And we should say maybe the price should float between you know, two boundaries. Uh, and maybe the trade date needs to be greater than one week ago, but less than today. And then if we have a look to see what that would generate, well, the data looks much better. <laughs> it still has a lot of challenges in it. Clearly the stock ID and the stock name don't match. Uh, and the price still has issues because um, there's uh, multiple, uh, I guess, significant figures after the, the decimal point. So it's getting a little bit more realistic. And even with some you know, simple rules, we've got, we've got much closer. But again, it's probably not usable for functional testing yet. Uh, it's, yeah, probably not usable for volume testing yet. It's definitely not uh, usable for uh, machine learning analysis. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, if we try and tighten those rules up a little bit more, we basically put in a condition uh, to line up the enumeration, the stock ID uh, with the stock name, and maybe give two decimal places for the float. Uh, and with the, the uh, trade date time, we'll, we'll keep the same. So if we go to that, the next slide. So actually, um, we're starting to get data that looks a little bit more realistic. I mean, there's still a lot of problems with the data, but I imagine that this would probably be fine for volume testing. But if you're trying to do functional testing, Clearly, you can see in this example, uh, the, the stock price of BT has varied wildly. Now, that's unlikely to work if you're, you're trying to get that into a system and you're using the, the, the stock price like that, because the system would clearly go, well, that stock price has jumped hugely. But actually, if you're doing volume testing, maybe that's OK. Maybe the shape of the data is accurate enough for volume testing. And as you can see, even this really simple example with five columns, you actually need to get a reasonable set of rules in place um, to start to get the data looking realistic. And we worked uh, with one particular client that had uh, very large files. Uh, and, and originally we were generating, uh, I think for 150 columns, they ended up generating over 3000 rules to make the data look realistic enough to do uh, volume testing. And even then it wasn't anywhere near realistic enough to do functionality testing. So that kind of gives you a bit of a feel for how quickly uh, using the rules-based approach, you can get to the point where you've just got too many rules to manage. Okay, next slide. Um, yeah, as I said, you know, with uh, 150 columns, we saw over 3000 rules uh, really quickly. And bear in mind, this is a really simple case. I've only looked at the challenge um, where we uh, have um, simple cases where each row is independent of the other. If you were trying to do something like generate a realistic looking bank account, the rules would be way more complicated. You would have to do rules on uh, how much money you're spending. You would want to, the rent to come out at the same time every month. And you might have dependencies between things. You might go, well, it's getting near the end of the month. The person hasn't got money in their bank account. Maybe they wouldn't withdraw 300 pounds cash. Next slide, please. Um, I think that should be it. Sorry, I went the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so as we, we, we talked about, a realistic bank account, salary coming in the same day every month, uh, same outgoings such as rent, etc. Outgoings, hopefully less than incomings, realistic amounts, coffee at prep shouldn't be £300, and also realistic number of events, i.e. you end up with a state system and, and rolling stats, i.e. balance. And when you get into that situation, you quickly come to the conclusion that you need to start handwriting the code. In fact, if you want data to be as accurate as the application, you probably end up getting to a situation where you have to write uh, as much logic in the generation of the data as the business logic that you have in your application originally. Uh, I think that's over to you now, Paul. Yeah, so I guess some examples that we've been looking at for ourselves, you know, providing realistic test data for our client onboarding platforms and they're quite complicated onboarding requests. So um, you handle all the KYC, um, very compl complicated kind of multi-nested level bits of data. Um, also looks at, you know, generating risk in PNL with realistic values. So by analyzing the production, you know, PNL data, and then using that to make sure that uh, things like tenors, currencies, curves, and all the rest of it all line up properly in a realistic way. And then using kind of almost similar values as well. So, and also we've uh, been generating portfolios of trade. So, you know, um, desired characteristics, so a little bit like scenario based. So we can generate a portfolio of interest rate swaps, 
to and di add different kind of characteristics into the generation of their uh, other things we've looked at credit card payments between merchants and cardholders again analyzing those data sets that's quite an interesting different kind of way you have to do the analysis um the other thing we're finding it helps very much with is um easy exploratory relationships with vendors and cloud providers so before you often let anybody near anything of your data you have a lot you have to get through signing contracts big ndas so if we start actually just sharing some purely fully public domain data sets between each other that, that are um structurally correct things become a lot easier very quickly in terms of that, that exploratory relationship um, so I was hoping to demo this today, but unfortunately my main desktop PC has, has died a death and blue screened. So I'm going to have to unfortunately walk you through this and not do a, a live demo. So with Data Hub, and I've, actually it's lucky you've only got a few minutes anyway. So simply to install Data Hub, use, it's Python based. Anyone who knows Python, you do pip install Data Hub core and you'll, you'll bring down the library. And then very simply, if we uh, were to handcraft some rules in a similar to Data Helix, we could, if we wanted to create, say, a set of accounts, we could quickly do this where we'll say, we want a region. Here's some data to choose from. Here's some weights for the data. Now we want a country. Um, so there's even, so Data Hub has kind of inbuilt types for things like current, countries, currencies, and those kind of things. So it understands already what they are. So we say, look, now give me a country and base the country based on the region field. So it will select countries now appropriate to the region. Then we'll say we want an industry. So, you know, are you in retail, um, banking, finance, you know, agriculture, whatever, and then generate a very specific industry code based off of that industry it's found. Now generate a legal name for that kind of thing, uh, that this record. So we'll call it, um, you know, um, ABC Mining Company Limited or whatever. Um, and so there's a lot of work in here where we generate them appropriate names synthetically uh, based on the industry and the country that that this thing's in. Um, and then we generate an LEI code or other things, EV, PV, whatever, and use various functions. So um, it's all in Python. So um, yeah, and it's very easy to extend. Now, if we were to look at the analysis, what we can do is you've got two different functions here. So this generate model function you see in the top, that's what you'd run inside your kind of in your inside your production domain. So you'll say, look, take this CSV file or whatever input stream it is. Now create this thing called a model file.json. So that's the output. And then you give it essentially the classifiers and the continuous values, also discrete values and continuous values. So you say, look, here's the region, country, zip code, industry code, zip name that I want you to analyze and work out how they're distributed. And then for inside these, this set of um, classifier information, these are like the continuous data values. So assets under management, estimated value. Um, and then there's a few other bits. We support like a plugin model. So this code's a little bit old. So there's different analysis modules, which are tailored towards different data sets. And also there's support soon, once I finish doing the PR, and it's in there, which will support kind of multi-table as well. So there's um, a bunch of stuff in there. And then what we can do here very quickly is we can then generate from that uh, that model. So we can now say, uh, generate from model. Um, this is called a fast bucket model. Um, so it's very, very quick. Give it that model file.json, which has got that different, that kind of statistical model in there. And now go and generate. And then we can also, you can see when we talk about enhancing the data, we can actually add back in things like a name and an LEI code, which work, which we removed from the original data set. So we can then add these extra attributes back onto it synthetically again. So that's kind of very briefly what kind of Data Hub does. And sorry, I couldn't do a live demo, but um, things went horribly wrong. Data Hub is also incredibly easy to extend. So if there's not a function in it you want, with a couple of lines of Python, you can, um, you know, extend it. So. So here's, here's one where now we're adding a little message in there and it's going to go, hello, whatever your name is. Um, it just takes a couple of lines of code to, to do that. Um, so that's how you can extend data. Uh, so if it's something in there you, that doesn't, you want extra, um, it, it's really easy. All right. Um, so what's next for Data Hub and Data Helix? So uh, the two projects, we're bringing them together. Um, if ever, we're also investigating in terms of the data specification how we integrate with the Alloy Legends uh, contribution to Finos, which is great. That's got a whole 
UML like uh, markup language, uh, sorry, functional language about it that describes data sets. So we're looking at how we can integrate with those so we can actually start generating data sets from legend uh, specifications. Um, so in the next version of Data Hub, we've got um, some extra bits. So data, at the moment, if we're doing analysis of data sets, all our models support classifiers with continuous. They, we haven't got anything that supports continuous values only, so that's a bit of a help enhancement. Integrating a CT GAN, so that's like a another big open source project that does um, that uses GANs to analyze data. So we're integrating that and then making it so it's seamless within the product. And multi-table support, so you just supply it, you know, a bunch of files and tell it what the foreign key, primary key relationships are, and then it'll be able to use that for its analysis and generate them as well. Um, we're also building in more financial types, so understanding of QCIP sizing, LEIs, curves, tenors, and all those kind of things, as well as things where in that data analysis, at the moment, you have to say what each is. Like, you have to say, look, these are the columns I want. So we're looking at building data type predictors in there so we can look at your data set and then go, well, that looks like a QCIP, that looks like a currency, that looks like a PII attribute to name or a currency, you know, something that's there. So it just helped move things along. And also we're looking at Spark integration for really big data set generation. So we'll we'll use PySpark to then you know generate actually on a, on a cluster. Um, and I think down the line, this is probably gonna be well into next year. We're gonna look at actually how we support agent-based modeling as well. So if you're trying to use, do simulation, how we can then synthetically generate actors uh, for you uh, to desired ways. So cool. Um, yeah, I guess this, Sounds any interest in you, you know, please reach out to us. Uh, the details should be around. Uh, in fact, they're not on this deck. I should put it on there. Um, we're always looking for help. So if you want to get involved, we're looking for anybody who can put a code in Python, particularly if you've got any kind of data science background as well, that would be fantastic. And if you want to help us, particularly on the Alloy or Legend integration, that would be really great to reach out to us as well. But uh, yeah, the if you can code in Python and want to get involved, Please do, even if you can't code in Python, uh, we'll, we'll teach you on the way. Um, yeah, Andrew, have you got anything to finish up with? Uh, no, that was great, Paul. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so that's, that's it. I think we maybe hope you've got a couple of minutes for questions. Which I shall help set out, see what we have. Cool, so there's no questions in. I guess we can probably um, maybe give it one more minute and then uh, wrap up. To the awkward silent part. Cool, great, thank you everybody. I'll put my contact details within the chat. Um, you know, please do reach out to us if, if you want to, that'd be great. Thanks for coming everybody. Thanks for attending everyone.